grace and the mercy of the Almighty God. We hear the instruction of God through the recitation of the Ten Words. The first commandment. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. What does the Lord require in the first commandment? That I must avoid and leave all my idolatry, sorcery, enchantments, inclination of saints, or other creatures, because of the risk of losing my salvation. Indeed, I ought to leave to my mouth the only true God, trust in him alone, and humility and patience, to all the earth and holy, and love and fear and honor him with my whole heart. In short,
Genesis 2, verses 15 and 17, and 3, uh, verses 1 and 7, through 7. Man and woman disobey God, eating all forbidden fruit. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God wanted him, warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you will surely die. Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The serpent was the shrewdest of all, of all animals in the, the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any tree, any trees in the garden? Of course, you may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not to are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the servant replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, her eyes opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed the fig leaves together to cover themselves. The word of God. Thank you, Jesus, God. The psalm comes to us from Psalm 32. My sin, my sin tormented me, but when I confessed, God forgave me. Well, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. What joy for those whose record the Lord has clear of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body gives away. Our second reading is taken from um, Romans 5, verses 12 through 19. Sin and death came from Adam. Grace and life come from Christ. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not disobey, disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious.
grace is given. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of, one, of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's sin brings condemnation for everyone. But God's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand for the reading of the Holy Ghost. Instructions and teachings. Okay. It's what we call 
Torah. Okay, so he begins. So we, he begins his ministry, and he goes to the River Jordan to be baptized by John. Now we celebrated or remembered the, the baptism of the Lord on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. It's called the baptism of the Lord. Um, I, I, we could have put it here. You know, it doesn't really matter. But um, there, Jesus goes, and he, in the Man Gospel of Matthew, which is what we're looking at this year, uh, there's an interesting thing, because he goes to be baptized by John, John the baptizer, in the Jordan River, and John says, wait a minute here, we got this backwards. I, I need to be baptized by you, not me baptizing you. And Jesus says, no, 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 this is done to fulfill all the righteousness. Now that's a theme, keep that in mind. In the Gospel of Matthew, remember Jesus has said, um, I have come not to abolish law, but to fulfill the law, and that your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. And he goes to point out what that all means, you know. Um, if you have anger in your heart, you've already committed murder. It's not just enough not to murder somebody, but not even to have anger in your heart, which leads to that. So he's, he's constantly going forward and saying, you know, that we're, we're going to get beyond just this simple righteousness, we want to have the righteousness exceeds that of the, of the Pharisees and the scribes, really going after it. And so he does that in his own life. So now he goes to the church and he says, I've I got to do this. i got to identify with this movement that John has, this call to repentance, this call to follow God, this call to be obedient, to be the people of God. So he does it. Then a voice from heaven comes. And what does the voice say? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now last week we saw that that same voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. With that little extra phrase in there. But in this case, it's the beginning of his ministry. It's the imprimatur of God. The endorsement of God. The commissioning of God. Be my faithful one. Now, he already has been, but now this is the kind of moment where he's going to be launching into his public ministry. So, of course, he goes from that and goes right into the streets and whips up the folks and off he goes. No. He goes into the wilderness. The wilderness? Why is he going into the wilderness? He's going into the wilderness to be tempted. Why would you do that? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? That's where he begins. Now, the wilderness, of course, harkens back to the story of the people of Israel. Because they wandered in the wilderness for how many years? Forty. Forty years. There we got a number. Now, what I always like to say about numbers in the Bible is, especially on certain ones, that they're very significant. And they mean more than the actual number. So, for example, the number three becomes very important. You see, three days. We eventually understand God is revealed to us in three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God sends Jesus to be for us our Savior, and then Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to be our His presence with us. You know, one comes after me. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just we start seeing that. That's number three. Three days, He's, you know, we have his death and then resurrection. So three becomes a very important number. Seven is a number of wholeness or perfection. Now, we now have seven days a week. Ever think about that? It doesn't have to be, I know that sounds mind-boggling, but it doesn't have to be seven. It could be five or ten or whatever. But we've, seven seems to be the, the number. For six days the Lord created, on the seventh day he rested. And so that becomes this number. And whenever you have seven in a Bible, or a derivative of seven, so it might be a uh, 49. 49 years, the next year is the year of Jubilee. It's a Sabbath rest for the people. That's an interesting concept. And different things like that. And then you have the number 12 for the 12 tribes of Israel. That becomes this, just this number. And then, uh, so when we get to the book of Revelation, we have 12 times 12,000, so we have 144,000. The whole people of God is clearly, clearly a symbolic number. And then we have 40. 40 becomes both, you know, a number and a symbolic number. Moses had 40, his life divided 120 years into three segments of 40. Now, I just want to hearken to add that remember, do 
not impose on the Bible our standards. We're weird. You know what time it is. Right? You know what day it is. Doesn't seem weird to us now. But in all the people who have ever lived in human history, metaphorically, there's about three people who knew what day and time it was. They didn't have a watch, they were a calendar on the wall. I don't even know what day and time it is. I was told by a friend of mine, <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but it's, it sounds cool. He said, um, this American Canadian tribe, the, the smallest demarcation of time was, I'll see you tomorrow, the next day. Not like tomorrow at noon, just tomorrow, sometime tomorrow, I'll see you. Sometimes I think that'd be all right. Uh, we get off, we're all worried about, we're all worried about punctuality, right? Never in the history of the world is anybody worried about punctuality, because they couldn't. They didn't know what time it was. Well now, so we say, maybe Moses was 37 and a half years, or 42 and a third, you know, I don't know, whatever. It could have been, I don't have any reason to doubt that he lived 40, 40, 40, but whatever. Just that's, numbers are like that in the Bible. They tend to be more symbolic. That's just the way it works. 40, so, so Jesus goes to the wilderness for 40 days. Well, that wasn't an accident. How long did the people of Israel wander in the wilderness? 40 days. How long was Moses on top of Mount Sinai? I'm, I'm sorry, wilderness 40 years. How, how long was Moses on Mount Sinai? 40 days. Elijah, when he's fleeing from the, the uh, King Ahab and Queen Joseph, he was out there 40 days. Listening to the still small voice of God. 40, 40, 40. So now Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. And he encounters. And this is a, a, a phrase that we hear in the Bible, but it's important. And we highlight enough, but the real temptation, the trials that we face, are from the world, the flesh, and the devil. In some ways, the world and the flesh go together. The world in the Bible is almost always, almost always, represented as hostile to the ways of God. And the goal is not to live to be conformed to the world, but be transformed, Paul says, by the renewing of your mind. That the idea of the world is not the place God wants it to be. <clears throat> the flesh is our sinful nature. It's who we are naturally. Not redeemed, not sanctified, none of that. Just who we are, our natural inclinations, our natural impulses. And of course, the devil represents the evil, the entity that's against us, the one who leads us into temptation, the one who seduces us, and so forth. So now Jesus actually goes out into the wilderness and encounters the world, the flesh, and the devil. The, that thing that's going to threaten to undo him, that thing that has undone Israel in some ways, in many ways. Now, the story of the people of Israel is quite interesting. Um, Sherry Messenger asked me last night, what are, what's the number of the ten deadly sins and what's number one? I said, I don't know, because I don't anything about the ten deadly sins, because they're not in the Bible. Okay, just to let you know. So, uh, whatever, I mean, I don't have anything against the ten deadly sins, but I'm too worried about the sins I already know that are in the Bible, and i got to deal with those. But so I said to her, I said, well, I'll tell you what, the number one sin in the Bible is I know. Do you have no other gods before me? Now, by the way, when Israel did that, that literally meant no other gods, like, you know, idols and that kind of thing. We don't have too much of that problem today. It doesn't say it doesn't exist in the world, but we have the gods of our own making, right? The kinds of things that we raise up as idols. But that's the number one problem, because God calls for faithfulness to himself. And if you think about what God is doing with Israel, so he forms Israel, and he says, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation, if you will follow in my ways. Your devotion needs to be to me. I like to call this the Switzerland effect. Switzerland, right? So Switzerland is absolutely devoted to neutrality. They're completely devoted to neutrality. They don't get involved. Now, you can say it's good, bad, or different, but that's what they are. So guess what? World War I, they weren't involved. It takes place all around. World War II, they don't get involved. It takes place all around. Why? They're neutral. You can't violate that neutrality. And they have set up systems that keeps them in this way. <coughs> I have to tell you a funny story. My, uh, 
My father, my grandfather came from Sweden, so my father was living during World War II, and so his friends are saying, what's the deal? How come uh, Sweden's not, how come Sweden's neutral? How come Sweden's not involved in the war? And my grandfather responds to all that was, they're not bad at anybody. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's, uh, uh, you know, you have this kind of notion. Sometimes people are they're, like they're really committed to that, and you can't buy like that. So uh, that's the way Switzerland is. And that's the way the people of Israel were to be. They were to be totally devoted to God. That was the thing that marked them. When they trusted in princes with their horses and chariots, as I like to call it, when they engaged in power politics, they lost. They lost to Assyria, they're going to lose to Babylon, they're going to lose to Persia, they're going to lose to the Greeks, they're going to lose to the Romans. They can't deal with it, they can't overcome it. But when they're devoted to Yahweh, they succeed. And actually, they did succeed in many ways. This is the oldest book in the world that's followed and studied. Aristotle, Socrates, all the rest of them, Buddha, all the rest, they're not older than this. This is over 3,000 years old, this story was made. They were extraordinarily successful in promulgating the Word of God. They didn't do it with might or force, they did it with faithfulness. The other thing, I, I, you've heard me say many, many times, you think about this, they were so devoted to God by the time of the Romans, that the Romans, they would not worship Caesar. They would not offer a sacrifice to Caesar. And the Romans, who were practical, said, okay, we're going to give you an exemption. You don't have to do it. Nobody else got the exemption. Of course, nobody else needed it, but nobody else. And But think about this. The Romans understood these people are so intense, their fervor is so great, that we cannot compel them to worship Caesar. No, they didn't make a compromise. They said, we'll pray for Caesar. We'll pray for the government. We'll pray for justice. They accepted it. Who would have thunk it? Never, ever, in the history of the Roman Empire was it against the law to be a Jew. It wasn't to be a Christian. That's another story. <coughs> That's what happens when you're fanatically faithful. They wouldn't do it. Well, they did some other stupid stuff that got them in trouble. But at this point, they're just following up. They're doing that. That's what they're going to be. Now, here's the problem in their own words. It's not our looking at them and saying, oh, they just weren't good enough. They didn't do it right. They say, we have sinned. We haven't done it. And so what happens is there's this constant tension to be in accordance with the world, to worship the gods of the people around them, to ensure their prosperity by covering all the bases, by doing stuff that is against what God wants, but they're seduced by other things. The way the Bible calls it, they go whoring after other gods. Now, some of our modern versions tame that down a bit, but I don't like to. King James and others say they go whoring after gods. That's really the truth. That's what they're doing. And it's a problem. That's the problem. And the prophets call are constantly calling them back and saying, listen, if you continue in your ways, God's going to execute judgment against you. Against you, your people, the land is going to make it all bad. But if you're faithful, God will reward you and will reestablish you and so forth. There's the idea of the remnant. Well, now all of this culminates in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I have to tell you, he's an unlikely candidate for that. He doesn't possess anything in his person that would lead you to say, oh yeah, this is the mighty warrior king that we've been looking for. That was true for some others. It was true for Saul. It was true somewhat for David. And he said, oh yeah, he's got, oh, yeah, he's got the appearance of a king. He looks like he's going to be a great leader. As Isaiah says in his great prophecy, there is nothing about him that we should have esteemed him. That's right. He's just a regular guy. But it didn't look like he was going to do much of anything. But then these things started to happen that people said, oh, What's going on here? What's with this guy? It starts with his baptism. The voice from heaven. Something went on. I don't know how much the word spread, but some, you know, just one of those things. People start to say something's different about this guy. And then he goes into the wilderness. And the story, we're not told how many people know it or what's going on, but that he carries that in his being. And so as he encounters 
the evil one, the tempter, or the world, remember the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil offers these temptations. And he starts with the most basic, our human fleshly need, the need for food. Now, for this bread, but of course, remember, we're looking at this from the eyes of these people who know their Bible. Remember the people wandering around the wilderness and they're crying out for bread, for food. We need manna. God, or we need bread, and then God gives them manna. And he takes care of them. And Jesus is not able to, he's not living off the land because it's not possible. It's not just that he has committed himself to fasting for 40 days, but also, when you're out there, it's not like there's a lot of food around. And so the tempter says, hey, listen, what? If there's plenty of stones, why don't you turn those stones into bread? You can do that if you are the son of God. And there's the key. Now, what's interesting about these temptations is what happens is that the tempter is wanting Jesus to prove to him. That's it. Not to anybody else. Prove to him. Him, that he is the Son of God. And he has to do these things, the things that the tempter, tempter says he has to do to prove that he's the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, take these stones and make them into bread. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy, scripture that's inside of him, comes out and says, Ah, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of Now, of course, this is figure. you've got to have bread to live. He's not saying it's not. But here's what's important. What's important is not just our sustenance. That's you know, kind of a basic level. But it's got to be more than bread alone. And the problem with the world is they think that all you need is the bread that feeds your physical body. It doesn't work. It's not enough. It's not really what we're made for. Jesus will later say, my food, my drink is to do the will of him who sent me. It's a part of him and, and everything about him. And the bread of life is what we're looking for, not the bread that just feeds us for our meals. As important as that is. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that's my bread. Wow. Well, then the tempter says, okay. And he takes him, and obviously in a vision, he takes him to the highest point of the temple, in the holy city, Jerusalem. And he says, you know what it says in the Bible? So now the Satan is using the Bible. In Psalm 91 it says, you know what, you can throw yourself down and the angel's arms will bear you up and so you won't uh, dash your foot against the rock. You don't have to worry about it. And obviously the point is, he's at a point in the temple, if he throws himself down, he's not going to survive the fall. It's going to be a fatal fall. But you don't have to worry because God's going to protect you. Now it is taken out of context. There is that promise of, uh, of this a protection that God has for his faithful people. But Jesus understands that this is not what, this, what the devil is interested in. He's interested in having God be put to the test. So again, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament from Deuteronomy. He says, you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. Like you're going to prove God exists because you're going to come up with this thing that needs to be done. That's backwards. It's the wrong way around. And finally, the great seduction. This is really something. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And all their glory and splendor. You can have all of it. If you just bow down and worship me. Now, I think this is the key to Jesus' overcoming of the temptations. Now, don't forget, we do this a lot. I can't do this. Jesus is the divine son, so we kind of think, ah, you can just take it away, put it away, there's nothing there. Then he doesn't have a temptation like we do. He's not tempted as we are, unless he is like us. How does he survive the temptation? Well, again, he's had preparation. This is his first day on the job, as we like to say. He's been preparing his whole life, giving himself for this thing. Remember, he was 12 years old in the temple. What, what does he say to his mother? Hey, Mom, i got to be about my father's business. And he's been about his father's business. And so now he understands that all of the kingdoms of the world are illusory. 
They're not going to blast. They're temporal. I love what, uh, just this thought, uh, Adolf Hitler said, the Third Reich would last a thousand years. How long did it last? Twelve. And Germany was utterly destroyed. Winston Churchill said, and I think it was a play on that idea of a thousand years, I, I would actually check it, but he said, if our, this kingdom of ours lasts a thousand years, it will be said of us, this was our finest hour. In their war against the Nazis. This was our fight. So last a thousand, a thousand year right, a thousand years for Britain. This will be our, our great finest hour. Jesus is able to understand that the kingdoms of this world are temporal, transitory. The grass withers, the flower fades. What? The word of our God stands forever. And so now as he faces with a tempter, and supposedly going to give him all this and be worshipped and bow down. He goes, I think, I don't want this. This isn't good enough. Because guess what? I'm working for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, which is forever. All this passes away, but God's kingdom is forever. In the Revelation, remember the wonderful words for the holiday, of course. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign as king of kings and lord of lords forever and ever. Jesus knew that. Because he was devoted to the Father. And Satan couldn't give him anything. The only one who could give him anything that mattered was God. Being faithful. Always faithful. Always trusting. Always doing the will of God. And there is a power in that. And the power is, I don't have to prove myself to you. He'll do that in other places. He'll do it on the cross. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Prove yourself. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He doesn't have to prove himself to anybody. But think about all those people. Think about Pontius Pilate. You know how we know about Pontius Pilate? We know about Pontius Pilate because of Jesus. Think about Caiaphas and the high priest. Those Caiaphas who said, better that one man died than the whole nation suffer. We know about Caiaphas only because of Jesus. That's right. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And one day it will be manifested in glory. Because his devotion, his commitment, his food was to do the will of him who sent her. And to be committed completely to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, that's where we follow. Not just to the high mountain, but into the valley, into the wilderness wherever Christ calls us. But in that, there's victory. The world, Jesus says, is a problem, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, we can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Through him. That's what Paul is really talking about in uh, Romans 5. Through the one act of dis disobedience, all died. One act of righteousness, many will be made alive. Alive in Christ, who calls us to them. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for this time, and for your great, great love for us. We're so thankful that Jesus shows us the way. And he doesn't do it the way we would expect, but he does it by absolute sacrifice, devotion to you completely depending upon you and every word that proceeds from your mouth. Help us be that breath that sustains our souls and our lives forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and uh, recite the, the Nicene Creed. Let us confess the faith of the one holy Catholic and universal and apostolic church. We believe in our God, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth,
She went in uh, yesterday afternoon and it kept her overnight. I never heard anything. Yes? We're so blessed to have Norman Ron with us today. Amen. <laughs> Good to see you, uh, Norman and Ron with us. Um, anybody else? Um, John and Jenny Tennant have COVID. Oh, um, they, 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 I think they said they got it on Monday, maybe. And uh, uh, so she, I, I texted her this morning, and she said, uh, John's feeling better, but she's still not great. But I mean, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be real terrible. Just pray for that. Pray for that. OK. Anybody else? Let's join together in prayers for people. Let us have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. As we pray for the world, he came to save, saying, Have mercy, O God. We pray for the church, the holy Catholic church throughout the world. Help us to confess with our lips, believe in our hearts, and show in our lives that Christ Jesus is our risen Lord. Have mercy, O God. And we pray for the world, the world we just talked about that is full of hostility and antipathy to God. Let the milk and honey of your promised land flow in every nation of the earth, so that all may enjoy the fruit of salvation. Have mercy, O God. Amen. And we pray for this community and all the communities in which we live. Let us be angels of your mercy, surrounding all who are in danger and lifting up those who are fallen. Have mercy, O God. Amen. And we pray for our loved ones. Deliver and protect them, be with them in their trouble, and satisfy them with long life. Have mercy, O God. Amen. And now we pray for your blessings to reside with all of us as we seek to live out our lives on this, in this veil of tears, in this world that is difficult, causes problems and difficulties. We're thankful um, that you watch over us and care for us. And we're especially thankful that um, uh, Ron and Norma can be with us today, all the difficulties that Ron has had. We're thankful. Uh, that you continue to bless and to heal and to help. Uh, we pray for um, uh, Carolyn as she finds herself in the hospital. And we pray that the doctors might uh, discover what the problem is and, and to deal with her to bring healing and wholeness to her. We pray for the tenants as they struggle with uh, COVID. We think about all the people um, on our prayer list and the people we know that have difficulties of one kind or another, health concerns. We're thankful that April and Aaron can be here as we uh, remember Bob and celebrate his life. We're thankful for his time with us, so long and fruitful. And uh, just thank you for his service to our church. Thank you, Lord. We're so thankful for the many things that you give to us and bless us with. Help us to take that which we have received and use it for the glory of your kingdom and for a blessing in the world around us. So we conclude. As we pour out our hearts in prayer, O oh God, lead us to pour out our lives in service to you, ever seeking your will, ever following your way, all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let's join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. When our ancestors were slaves in Egypt, strangers in the land, uh, you saw our suffering heard our cries, and came to deliver us, bringing us out of captivity into a land flowing with milk and honey. Therefore, we praise you. Join the song of the Universal Church in the heavenly choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Tested for 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus taught us to seek nourishment in your word, to worship and serve you alone, and to commit our lives to your providence and protection. We give you thanks to the Lord Jesus in the night before he died, took bread. Then we give you thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And the same way after supper, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, let us proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pour your word of faith into our lips. Put your word of faith into our lips and in our hearts so that we might confess that Jesus Christ the Lord is risen from the dead. Save us when we call upon your name. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, our Father, the God of glory, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance of Christ died for you. <coughs> Let us pray. O living Lord, you have fed us with your body. You have poured out your life that we might live. We thank you, for we have tasted your goodness in this meal. Fed, we are strengthened. Filled, we are renewed to share the abundance of your love to the hungry world. Amen. Let's stand and sing, O Jesus, I have promised.
Amen.